And before our reading of Scripture, let us offer a prayer that we may understand Scripture. Breathe your Spirit upon us, O Lord, as we listen to the Scriptures. Open our minds and hearts to receive your living word and fill us with renewed hope. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. This is another well-known Easter story, The Road to Emmaus. Hear now God's word to us. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God. Please pray with me. Jesus, we celebrate with joy your resurrection this Easter season. We thank you for this powerful story of how you accompanied two people on their journey to Emmaus and how you revealed yourself to them in the breaking of the bread. May you reveal yourself to us, Jesus, as we deepen our friendship with you today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I shared with you recently that I spent a week in Omaha, Nebraska at St. Benedict Retreat Center as part of a ministry experience I have every year with Renovari. And Renovari is a spiritual formation ministry originally started by Richard Foster. And every week I get to go and I get to partner with a team of people to teach spiritual formation every week, every year. And so I got to do this again And one of the reasons I love participating with Renovari once a year is that I get to hang out with some great people, and I get to hang out with a good friend of mine named Trevor Hudson. Trevor Hudson, I've shared with you about him before. He's a Methodist minister in South Africa. He's now 72 years old. 
And he's partnered with Renovari and partnered with people like Dallas Willard and Richard Foster for a long time now. And what I love about Trevor is that he cares deeply about friendship with God, friendship with Jesus. And I once came up to him and I said, you know, Trevor, you've been a professor to me through my doctor of ministry program at Fuller Seminary. You've been a mentor to me. And now you're my colleague with Renovari and you're my friend. And Trevor said, you know, being your professor was great, Chris. Being a mentor, that's wonderful. But the thing that I appreciate most of what you just said is that you called me your colleague and your friend. And I thought, wow, this is a great person in my life. This is a friend I can count on, a person with very low ego who just wants to connect deeply with people and with God. Trevor just gave his last teaching about friendship with God for Renovari because he's going to be uh, finishing working with them now that he's retired and he's going to do less traveling. But I got to hear him teach on friendship with God one more time. And I get so inspired by that talk that I want to share it with you when I come home. And so I'm going to do that today and we'll connect it to the story of the road to Emmaus. And for me, I really resonate with Trevor's emphasis on friendship with God because that's how I see my relationship with God too. There's a lot of ways we talk about our relationship with God though, isn't there? Think of the different metaphors. We talk about God as our father and we as children or God as mother, God as parent and we as children. That's a wonderful image. We use the topic of Jesus as king sometimes and talk about us as followers of a king, the king of kings. We use the image of God as our master and we as servants, sometimes that's in scripture. Or Jesus as a rabbi or teacher and we are his disciples. But I want to suggest today that maybe Jesus' favorite way of connecting to us, just like Trevor's favorite way of connecting to me, is as our friend. And I want to give a biblical foundation for that that I think you'll appreciate. John chapter 15, verse 15 says this. These are Jesus' words to his disciples. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Jesus wanted his disciples to be his friends. And they became his friends. The relationship with the disciples deepened. The formation of the disciples deepened to the point that Jesus no longer thought of them as a master to a servant or just a rabbi to his disciples. Jesus called his disciples friends. Jesus' favorite way of talking about his relationship with us is a friendship. I think that's a great biblical foundation. And what does that mean then for how we grow our formation? May I suggest it means we seek over time to deepen our friendship with Jesus. Leslie Weatherhead, in a book called Transforming Friendship, says the heart of Christian faith is friendship. And we are invited in this season of Easter to renew our friendship with Christ. Trevor Hudson gives some tips on how to do that. He says, first, come to Christ in your current reality. Our current reality is Christ's home address. Isn't that beautiful? Our current reality is Christ's home address. Jesus doesn't want you to feel like you have to get yourself all put together and like everything is perfect. He, he actually wants us to invite us into our home, even the messy parts of our home and to be with us, and to bring healing and wholeness and cleansing. But our current reality is Christ's home address. So just be real with Jesus. That's how a real friendship can deepen, when you can be real with your friends. That's true with God as well. Another tip is to come to know Christ through the Gospels. If you really want to grow in your relationship with God, the best example of God's personal relationship 
with his followers is in the Gospels where Jesus is walking with the disciples. That really is the central part of Scripture. All of Scripture is an opportunity to connect to God, but the Gospels is a central part where we get to know Jesus. And then we look at the Bible through the lens of Jesus and our relationship with him. So that's an, an advice, again, is if you want to grow in your relationship, in your friendship with Jesus, spend time in the Gospels and journey with them and put yourself in the stories and read them reflectively and see what God might say to you. Remember that Jesus is a living reality and not an abstraction. Jesus is a living reality, not an abstraction. So as you read these stories of Jesus interacting with real people in the past, remember Jesus is also going to interact with you in the same way. And as we cultivate a friendship with Jesus, we come to partner in what Trevor likes to say is God's family business. What is God's family business? That is the transforming and healing of the world. The transforming and healing of this world is the family business of God. When we cultivate a friendship with Jesus, we will partner with Jesus in what Jesus is doing. What Jesus is doing is the family business. The family business is the transforming and healing of this world. And as we journey with Jesus, it's okay to be honest about the fact that as we participate in that family business, there may be some resistance at times. Sometimes we feel consolation, deep comfort, deep alignment with God. Sometimes we might feel some resistance to all that God is inviting us into. And we need to normalize that. That's part of the journey of any friendship. There's sometimes connection, sometimes some resistance. Stay with it and let love eventually bring wholeness and comfort and encouragement. And you'll find that you are more likely to be in alignment with Jesus in the family business. But when you feel resistance from time to time, talk to Jesus about that and let Jesus meet you in your real reality. We are invited into the mystery of the mutual indwelling of Christ in us and us in him. That's what this friendship is about, the mutual indwelling of Christ in us and us in him. A big way we cultivate friendship with Jesus is through prayer. And here's how you pray as God's friend. You tell God the truth. What makes for good friendship makes for good prayer. So when we come to God, God doesn't really want the frilly prayers, the holy, like, make sure I do it right prayers. God wants the honest prayers. Tell God the truth. What's really happening in your life? And then give God a chance to respond. Here's a really powerful insight. We don't share with God our prayer to inform God of what's happening in our lives as if God doesn't already know. God knows everything. We share with God in prayer so that God has access to our lives. When we pray, we're not informing God of what God does not know. We're giving access to God in our lives, so that whatever God wants to do in us, God can do. That's why we share our hearts with God. And it cultivates an intimacy and a friendship, just like any friendship where we are open with helps cultivate intimacy. And one powerful way you can meet with God, remember, is in silence. Silence. I like this story that Trevor told about Desmond Tutu. So Trevor Hudson, minister in South Africa, Desmond Tutu, the famous archbishop of South Africa, was a friend of his. And Desmond Tutu apparently every year would spend eight days in silent retreat at a monastery. Eight days in silent retreat. And it was very important that Desmond Tutu did that for his spiritual walk. Desmond Tutu, as much as he was an activist working for human rights, he was a contemplative too. And the story is told that Nelson Mandela, the president of South Africa at the time, really wanted to talk to Desmond Tutu. And so he called the monastery. It happened to be during a time when Desmond Tutu was on his eight-day silent retreat. He called Desmond Tutu, and Desmond Tutu kindly said to whoever received the call, just let Nelson Mandela know that I am busy. I'm spending time in my eight-day silent retreat. I'll call him back when I'm done. 
And this commitment to his time of prayer, that story spread throughout all of South Africa. And it showed who Desmond Tutu really is or was. And so I love, I love that story as well. Silence is a wonderful way just to be with God. You can be silent with God as you walk out in creation. You can be silent with God after you meditate on Scripture for a bit and just want to be with God. The image that Trevor Hudson gives for cultivating silent prayer is to just sit by a warm fire and just warm yourself in God's love. Use that image if you want. And sometimes when you go before a fire, you're a little cold at first, and that's how we are sometimes when we enter into prayer or or silent prayer. But as you spend more time by the fire of God's love, you warm up. And that's what we can do in prayer and in silent prayer. So I shared all of my Trevor Hudson stuff with you now, and I'm going to move to our biblical story. And I think our biblical story is just a wonderful example of this focus on friendship with Jesus' disciples. Now, in your bulletin and on the screen there, you see a a beautiful image, and it is a, a painting done by Maximino Cerezo Barreto, who is a Spanish liberation artist, theologian, Claritian priest. And so if you look him up, you'll see he has a lot of beautiful paintings uh, that reflect specifically on the story of the road to Emmaus. And you'll notice in this one that this, there's actually a married couple with Jesus in this story. You may say, well, why is that? Well, for many, many years, people thought that this story of the road to Emmaus must be two men walking with Jesus on a road. And one of the names of the men um, in, the, in the history, people would say, was Cleopas, and probably it's just one of his buddies who was a guy. But recent biblical scholars, liberation uh, theologians, and even well-known theologians like N.T. Wright, have now looked at the scripture more closely and realized that it's very likely that Cleopas is the husband of Mary, um, and Mary was the Mary who was at uh, the cross. There's three Marys, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who's married to Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And this is found in John chapter 19, verse 25, if you want to check this out. So what's really interesting is biblical scholars are now starting to realize Clopas is another form of the name Cleopas. And actually, Mary's sister, uh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, probably was her sister-in-law. So Clopas, or Cleopas, is probably the uh, brother of Joseph. And that means that Jesus is actually walking with his aunt and uncle. Study this for yourself, and you'll find that there is a real biblical connection here. And it changes things for me. It shows that Jesus is about his, his family business as he's walking with his aunt and uncle. It shows a little humor, too, because he comes alongside and he's hiding. He's kind of teasing them a little bit, potentially, because why is he walking along with them and not revealing himself right away? Who, who, you know, what are you guys talking about? Oh, Jesus of Nazareth, tell me more about this Jesus of Nazareth and what's happened. Now, I know we're used to this being a very serious story, But can you see a little bit of the rabbinic humor that's happening that Jesus doesn't reveal himself right away? Maybe Jesus is being a little bit playful with them. And then he he talks to them about the scriptures and how they should be aware of who this Messiah is. And then he's going to keep on walking on that road to Emmaus. But he waits and they say, oh, stay with us, stay with us. And he goes in and he sits with them And then he breaks the bread with them, and he reveals himself to this married couple, maybe his aunt and uncle. What a powerful, powerful story. Do you see the friendship of Jesus that's cultivated in this story too? Do you see how they're on a journey with him, and we also are on a journey. We are on a road of our lives, and Jesus companions us 
but sometimes we don't see Jesus on the road of our life. Sometimes we don't realize who he is. He may even be playful with us and we aren't catching it. We might be confused, but maybe something's burning within our hearts. This friendship, this longing that God has for us to be friends with him, it's, it's, it's there in our hearts, but we're, we're, we're not paying attention to it all the time. But what a wonderful invitation this couple has when they say, stay with us, stay with us. We, we just did our Friday prayer retreat on this passage, and a few people who were meditating on this scripture said, oh, I loved it when he said, stay with us. And we need to say that to Jesus. We need to invite him into our homes. Remember, he wants to make home with us in our present reality, but we have to invite Jesus in. We have to say, stay with us. And when we do, what a gift. Because when we cultivate intimacy with Jesus and friendship, when we say, stay with us in our present reality, Jesus will reveal himself to us as our closest friend and will bring healing and wholeness to our lives. Trevor Hudson says the most powerful reason why we need to see Jesus as our friend is because it heals the loneliness in our lives when we know that God is our friend, that Jesus is our friend. And we need each other. We need other people beyond only our relationship with God. God brings us into Christian community. But isn't it beautiful to think that part of what this friendship with Jesus is all about is healing our loneliness? That's what Jesus wants to do. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper in a little bit. And as we do that, I'm going to remind you to see this as a time of cultivating your friendship with Jesus. See this as a time to be real. Receive what you need from Jesus today. Receive the comfort, the compassion. Bring your loneliness to Jesus and let him be the one who provides for you what you deeply need, that deep intimacy. And when you cultivate that intimacy with Jesus, it leads to intimacy with other people in your life. I think of people who are in marriages today who maybe need that relationship with Jesus to be cultivated and then to see each other, see the spouse more clearly and with more love and compassion. I think of any of us who are looking for friends in our lives who could be there for us, or maybe we have someone we need to reach out to who feels lonely right now, When we cultivate our friendship with Jesus, it leads us to be friends with others and to show God's love in a powerful way because until we receive grace and love and friendship with Jesus for ourselves, it's very hard to share that with others. So receive it for yourself today in the Lord's Supper and then let us love one another. Let us be friends with one another. Let us remember that Jesus preferred relationship with us is a friendship and that we can have friendship with the risen Lord. Will you pray with me? Jesus, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you didn't just come to earth to meet the disciples only or your followers that were here when you were alive on earth, but through your resurrection, you desire deep eternal friendship with us, and it begins now, but it can go forever. So help us to cultivate that friendship. Help us to renew that friendship with you in this Easter season. Help us to meet you in the breaking of the bread and and in the scriptures read and and in God's creation and in, in all the beautiful ways you are trying to reveal yourself to us. Help us even notice your your humor and your nudges and your reminders that you are here and that you are all about love and all about meeting us where we are. And we give you thanks and praise in the name of Christ. Amen.